other sides. I it can't read that. Quite I don't even know why I have that. Okay. Okay. Coming out that it's not just the pressure that creates the problem. Okay. Yeah. Someone might have glaucoma at a lower pressure than somebody else. I know. And and the damage may be worse at a lower pressure for that person. For that person. So, that's the trick. So it's not. That's what yes. they're telling you. So that's why. That's why he's saying. You know, it's All right, numbers, folks. We're getting not, set up here. Although he wants to get that number lower. Well, sure. And for you, he might want, want it lower because of the damage he's seeing being done. Well, originally, I, I didn't understand it that way. I didn't understand the damage that had been done that made him know that I should be at a lower yes. pressure. Yes. I was all putting this together. It was all quite new. Oh, yeah. I can't do that. that I sent you from yeah. out of the University of Georgia, yeah. which is where it sounds like it came yeah. from. I was wondering if... if he was out of Georgia. He went to. Oh, you know, I don't know. He, but it was an interesting I study. Him up. I got um, well, it. Won't work. Uh, it helped me understand a little bit more what you're saying. So. Well, yeah. After I did some more research, I did. Then I felt fine. I was reading it. And this is what they're recommending. Yeah. That's been going on enough through all their trials and everything. Mm -hmm. It's not like it's discovered. So you're gonna run your third arm and get that thing. Oh, I'm sorry. Um, oh, that, injecting that little whatever that is. Yeah. No, I think that's. Well, like and then really I don't have to take it. the drug that does tend to vanish away with tears or whatever, like, whereas this thing um, it doesn't vanish mm -hmm. away. And it is about four to six months. Mm -hmm. Yeah, so I, I feel better about it. Good. Yeah. And I just How's the sound, folks? How's the picture? How's the sound? Sounds like you're talking pretty quiet, so I don't know how the... You'll find out in just a second. Hey, John Reigns. Grace, Robin, sound. Thanks, Robin. Yep, good. All right. And the Indian land bubble goes over the top of us. How's the sound now? Now that I'm over on this side of it, on the Floyd side of things. Oh, we got that circle of light again. Oh, do I have the TV? Yeah, I have this. I don't see it here, honestly. No, yeah, you're looking at the wrong angle. Okay, okay. Yeah. So, which way do we go? Probably this way. That disappeared. Yeah, again, the camera, you got to be right at the camera angle. Well, that put it right over the Jeep. Oh, really? Well, check now. Okay. You see it? Oh, you sure do. It's on yours, but it's not on the screen yeah. there. No, because of the angle you're looking at it. Okay, I think I can do this. Okay. Okay. Let me try this a little more. And then I'm going to do... Actually, <laughs> that's, that's you got, just you got a, a, so one, one third of a, of a circle, but you're okay. Yeah, and actually, I've got more than that because I'm moving things here. Mm -hmm. Yeah, so I'm trying to figure out. That gets rid of it entirely. I just want to make sure that you're not blocking the screen and your man-sized shoulders and things. How's that seated there, Cheryl? You'll see in just a second. I've got the. Uh, you probably need to move that a little to the chair a little to the right. Okay. His right. Yeah. I moved it to my right. Why is it just part of my face, or is it? You, you're kind of on the edge. All right. Yeah. I just want to make sure Floyd's shoulder is not blocking all the words, um, though. Well, okay. I have seen it blocked from the Thursday time. Yeah, but that part, yeah. But not the rest. Okay, all right. So, how are we doing for time? It's uh, 6.30. All right, 6.30. Okay. Hey, folks. 
<laughs> welcome, welcome to. This. It's like we're doing this for the first time every single week. So, and actually, what we have is a little ring light right there that uh, it helps uh, helps sort of spotlight things. But you'll you'll see the ring on the TV on the reflection of the TV. High def. Uh, these high def uh, TVs are marvelous, but they uh, they do reflect an awful lot. Uh, anyway, that was quite the little system that went through there for a few minutes. I was kind of wondering. We we're going to lose power. How that was going to work? If Floyd and Pam were going to be able to make it over here from the from the back south 40, back 40, back 40. <laughs> yeah, down on down on that side over there, they made it. They said there was some some rushing water um, along the way. Anyway, glad we made it through that. Now the Indian Land bubble is over the top of Indian Land the way it should be, so we appreciate that. Thank you for being here uh, this coming Wednesday. Uh, the uh, Bernie May has invited a friend, a former Carolina Panther, uh, John Casey, was a, a kicker for the Panthers for, uh, retired as a Panther for almost two decades. Um, uh, and uh, John Casey, guys, is uh, going to uh, give his testimony on, uh, on Wednesday morning. We'll be at La Peep at 8.30, and uh, John Casey's going to be there with Bernie and I've also I've met Jason Elam before through through Bernie and Jason Elam was a long time uh, Bronco two two time Super Bowl uh, winner and a uh, long time kicker for the Broncos and and Elam and, and Casey their numbers are just eerily similar over very very long careers and uh, I know Elam and I've met him a couple of times he's a marvelous guy good Christian but uh, he's got. Kind of you don't you don't get to where those guys are without being a little bit competitive, and he's kind of got that look in his eyes. And it's going to be fun to see if Casey's got that same look because I got a feeling they're wired pretty much the same way. And my question to him is going to be, okay, what what age were your kids finally when they just told you they weren't going to play anything with you anymore because it didn't matter whether it was Uno or pick up basketball in the driveway. You were you're just so competitive you can't really turn that off. And so it'll be interesting to, to see him and, and hear his, uh, his, his walk with Christ. Then Sunday next week, Easter Sunday, uh, next week, April 4th, we are having the sunrise service at the Lodge Pavilion. We'll get started about 6.45 or so, sunrise is at 7.08, and we will have a couple, uh, couple songs. Floyd will uh, teach as well, and we'll, we'll have you out there by 7.30. Uh, anyway, and then uh, 1030 for the 1030 service that we have uh, with uh, David, we will be celebrating the Lord's Supper together uh, after that. So David will be leading us as, as he finishes up his lesson on that. If you would like a, uh, a uh, Lord's Supper or communion care package like we did last time, uh, Cheryl and I will gladly bring, you, uh, bring that to your house on uh, Saturday. As long as you don't live in Kansas, uh, Chuck and Susan Thomas, or in Texas... Wayne and Linda Fisher, uh, we will we will deliver those to your house because I know you guys tune in uh, quite often. Uh, thank you for being here. Uh, I'll turn it over to Floyd to to open in prayer and and uh, and uh, let us let us know where where he's going with this uh, tonight and in the future. Again, thanks for being here. How's that? Whatever gets you comfortable. Is that okay on the screen? That's good. Let's go on the camera. Well, good evening, folks. Here we are on a, a rainy Thursday night, huh? But we are here and we're ready to continue along the journey with Abraham in his walk of faith. The relentless pursuit of living by faith. You know, it is a constant battle to stay focused. And just like we're talking about these athletes, you know, they've learned to stay focused on their game. Uh, we need to make sure that we kind of stay focused on uh, staying close to the Lord and listening to his voice and his word and, and following him in faith. I found a verse for you tonight in Isaiah. A verse that we often quote is Isaiah 41.10, but I wanted to include parts of 8 and 9 so you can see a little context because it ties right in with our study of the life of Abraham. The Lord says through Isaiah, but you, Israel, my servant, the offspring of Abraham, my friend. 
Abraham, my friend, and James is going to refer to that in James chapter 2, and he was called the friend of God. Then it goes on and saying, saying, saying to you, talking to Israel, and since we are the offspring of Abraham, spiritual offspring of Abraham by faith, I think we can apply this. You are my servant. I've chosen you and not cast you off. Fear not, for I am with you. Be not dismayed. Don't, 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 don't get so distressed that you're ready to throw in the towel. For I am your God. I will strengthen you. I will help you. I will uphold you with my righteous right hand. So when the world seems like it's uh, just circling, going down, we need to make sure that we stay focused on our God who is able to strengthen us, help us, uphold us by his righteous right hand. So since God calls Abraham his friend and we are his offspring by faith, why don't we come to the Lord and let's Let's, uh, let's pray and ask the Lord to open our eyes to other truths from the life of Abraham. Father, we thank you again for all the good things you've given to us in Christ, the offspring of Abraham, the one that you promised. And Father, we thank you that you kept your word and you did send Christ into the world. And Lord, from all these lessons that we've learned from the life of Abraham, I pray that you would help us to be able to uh, apply them to our lives, remember them at the right moments when we are tested and when we are um, challenged in our own faith. And Father, may we just be able to stay close to you, not live in this world fearful, but live in this world trusting, trusting you. We ask that you would continue to bless our country, give our uh, leaders uh, in whatever level, from the president on down, oh Lord God, I just pray that you would give them your wisdom help them father to listen to your voice and your word and lord god i just pray that our our land would uh, uh, be healed from so many of the things that it is afflicted with at this present moment in history help us tonight to see great things out of your word in jesus name amen well as we get into the life of abraham i want us to take a moment and find ourselves on the map, where Abraham uh, is. Now, in chapter 2021, 20, remember, he was living over here in this area, just from Gerar towards Beersheba. He was in Hebron and went down here, and he's been circulating in this little area right here. This is where Hagar, uh, when she was uh, driven out, the last uh, last uh, chapter that we saw there, and, and she went down this direction, uh, got lost, but the Lord confirmed his promise to Abraham's seed, Ishmael, that would make of him a great nation to, to her. And that's where we left them. And now we're coming back to that last part of chapter 21. And it's like a, it's like a preamble, if you will, to what we're, the, the meat of what we're going to look at in chapter 22. And that's why I put up here, Mount Moriah in Jerusalem, because that's Salem over here, but it's come later, become Jerusalem. Mount Moriah is the place where Abraham was going to offer Isaac as a sacrifice. And that Mount Moriah in Jerusalem is the place where the Lord appeared to David, and that's where Solomon built the temple, on Mount Moriah. So this is a very significant location right here. And from this area where Abraham is at the end of chapter 21, it's about a three-day journey you walk, donkey ride up to that spot. And we'll see that in our text tonight. Well, now that you've seen sort of the geography of the uh, context tonight, let's look at some of the, the interesting issues that were brought up. Steps and stumbles in the life of faith. In Genesis 21, verses 22 to the end, 34, it's sort of a fast story, but it does help us see the, the mental state of Abraham before God put him to the test, with this rigorous test of offering up Isaac. Have you noticed that uh, sometimes the older you get and the more victories you see in your walk with faith, the Lord gives you even a greater test well, that's what we're seeing in the life of Abraham. He, yes, he has stumbled. Yes, he has failed, but he got up and then he worked, he did what was right and he obeyed God. And it looks like here, now he has the promised seed. 
Remember, Isaac was born. They had this great party. Oh, he had to let Hagar and Ishmael go. But now it seems like things are rocking along pretty good. As a matter of fact, in verse 22, it says, At that time, Abimelech and Phicol, the commander of his army, said to Abraham. Now, remember, Abimelech is the king in Gerar, and that is a Philistine territory. These are people who actually invaded Canaan, if you will. They were not part of the Canaanites. They invaded Canaan from the Kaftor area, uh, something from what we might call Cyprus and Crete, other places like that, or even on the Greek peninsula. But here they come, and there he is, and look what Abimelech says. Remember, this is the fellow that took uh, uh, Sarah into his harem prep time in chapter 20. This is the fellow that God appeared to and said, you're nothing but a dead man. You're a dead man walking if you touch that woman. And this is the man that came to Abraham and said, what have you done to me? So he knew that God was doing something special with Abraham. So now some years have gone by. And Abimelech and Phicol came and said to Abraham, God is with you in all that you do. Now, isn't that a good testimony? So Abimelech is seeing that this man is prospering. I, I don't know why he, he seems to be able to, to run his affairs. He has this huge number of shepherds and workers, and, and they're doing things the right way, and they're making a profit, making a good living, and they've been a blessing to me just being around me. God is with you, and the Lord's blessing me because you're around now, therefore, swear to me here by God that you will not deal falsely with me and with my descendants or with my posterity, but as I have dealt kindly with you, so you will deal with me and with the land where you have sojourned. And Abraham said, I will swear. Now, you might think it's a little bit strange. There's two things in there. One is, I notice, Abimelech says, God is with you in all you do. But I also want you to swear to me, you will not deal falsely with me. Why did he say that? Abraham and Sarah had deceived him, you remember? And yet God is with this man. And so you know, kind of like a gentle reminder. And Abraham says, you've been good to me. You've been kind to me. God's prospered me in this land. I will swear that I'll deal justly and right with you. You know what? It's nothing wrong with living peacefully among a people that really don't know the Lord. God's people can do that, and Abraham is an illustration of that. We can live peaceably with others around us. And Abraham said, I'll swear. And then the text goes on. <laughs> Interestingly, it's as if <clears throat> that swearing might have been you know, back a little farther, and then some time went on, but... When Abraham reproved Abimelech about a well of water that Abimelech's servants had seized, whoa, water is precious, and Abraham had dug a well, and seems like Abimelech's servants had seized it from his servants, and so he comes to Abimelech, and just because we live peaceably among a people and we're strangers in their land doesn't mean we are doormats. So he goes to him, he says, now we've got an agreement, and he says to Abimelech, I do it, 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 talk to him. He reproved Abimelech for, for what his servants have done. And then Abimelech says, I do not know who has done this thing. You did not tell me, and I, I have not heard of it until today. So he, he gives his defense. And actually, the words that they use here and this whole thing of reproving is a judicial word of the time. And Abraham has said, you know, we made an agreement and you violated the agreement. And he said, I didn't know, I didn't know. And so making his defense, and so verse 27, so Abraham took sheep and oxen, gave them to Abimelech, and the two men made a covenant. So he's going to make this even more legally official. And so the text then goes on to say, Abraham set seven, I underscore seven because it's going to be important in the text. Abraham set seven ewe lambs of the flock apart. And Abimelech said to Abraham, what is the meaning of these seven ewe lambs that you have set apart? And he said, these seven ewe lambs, I mean, didn't we get it? Okay, seven ewe lambs you will take from my hand that this may be a witness for me. Do you see the legalities going on here? a witness for me among these, before God and these witnesses, 
that I dug this well. Therefore, that place was called Beersheba. That was the place just a little to the east from Gerar there. And it's called Beersheba because there both of them swore an oath. Beer is well, Sheba is an oath. But the reason I underscore the seven and the seven mentioned, seven and oath are very closely related words. Matter of fact, some people think that to put yourself under a seven is to make an oath and swear by that. It's almost like you said seven times, I swear, 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 seven times. And so it's just like that. And so they're doing this thing very, very legally. They both swore an oath. So therefore that place was called Beersheba because there both of them swore an oath so they made a covenant at Beersheba. Then Abimelech and Phicol, the commander of his army, rose up, returned to the land of the Philistines. You see that? First time we really saw that right there. Philistines. And Abraham is going to hang around Beersheba. This well that he had dug. This well that is now legally vouched to him, so to speak, by all the protocols of that day. And Abraham planted a tamarisk tree in Beersheba. It's like a, a tree that would grow in a kind of an arid climate. It's a, it could be a kind of an oak, if you will. Think of all the different oaks we have around here. We have pin oaks with their nice uh, jagged leaves. We got blackjack oaks that are sort of wild. And then over here on some of our uh, uh, pods, we have, we have um, live oaks, the small little leaves. And, you know, they do quite well when they don't have much water sometimes. So that's the kind of a tree that Abraham, not saying it is the, the tree, but it's kind of a tree like that. It's a different leaf. It can survive. It doesn't expirate too much into the atmosphere, and it, and it can survive uh, drought times. He's planted a tamarisk tree in Beersheba. So now he's got this tree. He's got well, and he called on the name of the Lord the everlasting God. No doubt he built an altar. Abraham is living a life of peace, prosperity, and he's worshiping God. Everything looks like it's falling into place. And he calls on the name of the Lord, the everlasting God. And Abraham sojourned many days in the land of the Philistines. Now that is the preamble to chapter 22. You see, many days is probably telling us this is when Isaac, the boy who was weaned in chapter 21, is now grown to 12, 14 years of age, something like that, because he is going to be carrying some wood on his back in chapter 22, and he's going to be a pretty good boy there to be able to go up a mountain with wood on his back. But here Abraham is calling on the name of the Lord, the everlasting God. As we have walked, walked through the life of Abraham, the Lord has progressively revealed himself to Abraham under different names. You see, in Genesis, he's called God in chapter 1, and then he's the Lord God, Yahweh Elohim, in chapter 2, the Lord God. And then when it comes to Abraham, he is God, who calls him out of Ur the Chaldees. And then in chapter 15, he is the Most High God, El Elyon. When Melchizedek met him, and then as he gets closer and closer to being uh, having the the promise of the seed through Sarah and not through Hagar, he's revealed as El Shaddai, the powerful provider, the God who can provide, and now here he is the Lord Yahweh, the everlasting God, El. Olam, the God who stays and stays and stays and stays, the everlasting God. And Abraham may have been thinking about all that the Lord had done and knowing, you know what? Things are going to happen, but they may not all happen in my lifetime. But I know God's going to carry out his word. And this, to me, I think, is probably the context 
in which we get this little in, uh, idea as we get into a little farther into the New Testament. And we'll look, look at this. But remember, he is a pilgrim worshiper. The tent as a pilgrim, the altar as a worshiper. Here was Abimelech and Phicol and all of his crowd going back to those five cities, city-states of the Philistines. What's Abraham doing? He and all of his big entourage are in tents like nomads out there, and they are nomads. But now they're just sort of settling around the Beersheba area. An altar to worship. He is a pilgrim worshiper. So then, I believe, is where possibly we could, we could put Hebrews chapter 11, verses 9 and 10. By faith, Abraham, he went to live in the land of promise as in a foreign land, living in tents with Isaac and Jacob, heirs with him of the same promise, for he was looking forward to the city that has foundations, whose designer and builder is God. We don't really have a whole lot of specifics in the life of Abraham that points to that, other than the fact that here is one who is looking for a city that's going to persist. It's going to be there, and it's not going to be just sojourning. This is the land that God promised to me, and I look like a foreigner and a stranger in this land, and the Lord's going to give us a permanent place that lasts one day. That's why I think it might really be about this time that he connects El Olam, the God everlasting, to the Lord who is in fact the one who's made the promise. That's just my conjecture. But that's his mindset. Peace, prosperity, worshiping, things are going pretty well. Chapter 22. Have you ever noticed that when, like we said before, when you get all your ducks in a row, one flies away? Have you ever noticed that life just doesn't give up? It just keeps coming at you. Sometimes things are just new things walk in. You have new people that come into your life or someone new at work and it causes a difficulty or something else happens. The neighbors change and you don't get along with them like you got along with others. There's one thing after another after another and it just keeps rolling along, doesn't it? And sometimes things leave. Sometimes you're just having a good time and suddenly you get sick. Didn't, th didn't see that one coming. Or you break a leg or you break an arm and, and then things don't quite heal right and all those wonderful exercises and sports that you used to like to be involved in and it's just not quite the same. You know, some things come in, some things go out, whether it's people or, or finances or you're looking forward to retirement and, and then something happens to a spouse and you don't fulfill those dreams, your plans go away. The Lord tests us. He tests us all along the way. Abraham here is one of the really serious tests. And here's where the Lord tests him to let go. He sent Ishmael away. That was heartbreaking to him. But he understood this is the seed. This is the one. This is the one that you promise it's going to be the, the line of the offspring that's going to be through that offspring is going to be a blessing to all the nations of the world. And now the Lord tests him. Let's look at it. Genesis 22, 1 and 2. After these things, God tested Abraham and said to him, now this word test is like we have in the New Testament. It doesn't mean tempt to sin. The Lord never, according to James 1, 13, he never tempts any of us to sin, but he does put us to test to disclose the solidity, if you will, of your faithfulness. And then it becomes real to you through that test. You can see it too. So God will do that. And that's what he's going to do with Abraham. He has brought him along the way. Abraham has seen God step after step after step. And now the Lord's going to put him to this ultimate test. And he said to him, Abraham, I wonder what that voice sounded like. You know, I've often wondered, what does God's voice sound like? Is it booming from heaven? What is it? Or is it just that in your spirit you sense that he's talking to me? Abraham. 
And he said, here I am. That's a Hebrew phrase, and you hear that, see that a lot. Even Moses is going to say that, and many of the saints of the Old Testament say that because it's just a, a typical Hebrew expression. Um, Hineni, here I am <laughs> in Hebrew. Hineni, I, here I am. And he said, take your son, your only son Isaac, whom you love, and go to the land of Moriah and offer him there as a burnt offering on one of the mountains of which I shall tell you. Whoa! Now that's when I would be tempted myself to throw in the towel on this trust thing. But God said to Abraham, take your son. Now notice how he just, he just mounts up the phrases. Your only son Isaac, whom you love, and go to the land of Moriah. That go to the land of Moriah is like Genesis 12. Leave your country and your kindred and go to the land that I'll show you. And now the Lord said, okay, I want you to go to Moriah. It's a, a very similar kind of thing. As we saw the life of Abraham beginning in chapter 12, the beginning of the promise, now we have the ultimate test of the promise here towards the end of Abraham's life. Your only son, Isaac, whom you love. The reason I underscore only is because I've got a question for you. In what sense is it only? Abraham had Ishmael. He fathered Ishmael. How is it that he's your only son? Well, let, let's, get, let's dig into that just a little bit. First off, notice when it says the land of Moriah, before we go to the person, the land of Moriah, Mount Moriah, as I said before, is in Jerusalem itself, right up to one of those mountain peaks that Jerusalem is situated on. But this is going to be the site of Solomon's temple. Second Chronicles 3.1 actually says it was built on Mount Moriah where God appeared to David. We'll come back to that one. But let's look at this. Take your son, your only son, Isaac. Look how Hebrews uh, words this. Hebrews 11 verses 17 to 19. By faith, Abraham, when he was tested, all right, here we are, offered up Isaac, and he who had received the promises was in the act of offering up his only son. The New Testament says the same thing. His only son, of whom it was said. Now we're going to see how only fits, since he also has Ishmael. Through Isaac shall your offspring be named. It's not through any other son that you may have begat, that you may have fathered, but this is the only son through whom you your offspring is named, and that's where the Messiah is going to come. That's really the heart of it. He considered that God was able even to raise him from the dead. Talking about his, uh, Isaac. Uh, when he was about to sacrifice him, from which, figuratively speaking, he did receive him back. But I want you to notice something, and this is just a little theological tidbit to toss in here. When he says, your only son, some of you in a, you know, the King James Version, sometimes you, you see this only begotten son, like John 3, 16. Uh, God so loved the world that he gave his only begotten son. And some of our newer translations just say he gave his only son or his one and only son. This is the word monogenes, mono one, genes like genesis, genetics. It just means one of a kind, one of a kind. And this is what I believe is the real meaning there in John 3, 16. It's the unique one. We're called sons of God. But Jesus is the one and only, the unique one. It wasn't that he was begotten at some point in eternity, which is kind of a, how can you be begotten in eternity in a spot? In, in, in time? No, 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 no. And theologians in the Middle Ages argued and argued and argued over that. And I think what we have here is help from, Ishmael, from uh, Isaac and Abraham. We have help that this was your only son, not that he only begot one son, but this is the one that's designated. This is the unique one. And for sure, he was born in a unique way. Huh? So that's what, I, what the text is telling us. Isaac is the one. He's the one through whom God is going to 
bless the world. So what does Abraham do? Well, let's move out from the test of faith to the obedience of faith. And notice in verses 3 and 4, So Abraham rose early in the morning. Do you remember Genesis 21, 14, when the Lord says, Listen to Sarah's voice, and you take Hagar and her son Ishmael, and you, you take them and you send them away? And so the next day, the text says, Abraham rose early in the morning. Same phrase. He saddled his donkey, took two of his young men with him and his son Isaac, and he cut the wood for the burnt offering and arose and went to the place of which God had told him. Now notice, on the third day. Now I'm not trying to read too much in on the third day, but this is going to be very, very significant when you think about our Lord Jesus rising on the third day and Abraham receiving Isaac back as in a figure from uh, raised from the dead. On, but on the third day, Abraham lifted up his eyes and saw the place from afar. Mount Moriah, believe it or not, right today is inside the Aqsa Mosque. The Muslims, because Muhammad believed that there was a night trip that he took to Jerusalem and he was landed right there and they built the Aqsa Mosque on top of this Dome of the Rock. That's Mount Moriah. And they say that that's the spot. Well, we don't know for sure, but it's traditionally that spot. I actually was able to visit that and go into that, that Aqsa Mosque uh, once when I visited Israel. It was a very hot uh, time. The, the paving stones were so hot, and yet they wanted you to take your shoes off. And so we did. And they had carpet all the way across those stones, and they wet the carpet down with water so that you wouldn't burn your feet. And I thought, man, I had to get my socks all wet and soggy. And so I was starting to walk on the sidewalk, and it was hot until I jumped over on the, on the carpet, no matter if it was wet or not, and went in. And there it is, inside Fence around it, you can see the contours of the big rock. And that's apparently, supposedly, traditionally, where they were headed. On the third day, lifted up his eyes and saw the place from afar. And as they get closer, verse 5 tells us, Then Abraham said to his young men, Stay here with the donkey. I and the boy will go over there and worship and come again to you. Now that's Abraham's statement of faith. This is why Paul says he didn't waver in his faith in Romans chapter 4. He's not looking at his entire life. He's talking about here at the end, he grew to this place. And he says, we're going to go worship and we're going to come again. And Abraham knows that God told him, you've got to sacrifice that son of yours. Wow. And Abraham took the wood of the burnt offering, laid it on Isaac, his son. It's got to be big enough to hold that wood. And he took his, in his hand, here's Abraham, with the fire and the knife. So they didn't have, uh, you know, big lighters or anything like that. So he had, he had fire he took with him and the knife. And his son had the wood. And they're leaving the young men with the donkey. And they're making their final trek up to the top of that mountain that the Lord had told them, and uh, it's in the land of Moriah. And he took in his hand the fire and the knife. So they went, both of them, together. It's kind of a touching scene. Now, I don't know how long it took on this little trip, but Isaac began to think. And Isaac said to his father, Abraham, my father, now, you know what that is? Ab, as you know, his father, like Abba, father. Ab, my father is Abi. It's almost like daddy, you know, daddy. His Abi, my father. He said, here am I, my son. Ben is the word son in Hebrew, and this is just Beni. And so he's saying Abi, and he says, Hineni Beni, here I am, that's my son. And uh, he says, behold, hey, dad, I see the fire, and I see the wood. I see the fire. And I see the wood, but where's the lamb for the burnt offering? The boy's not dumb. He's old enough to understand. And Abraham said, God will provide for himself the lamb 
for a burnt offering, my son. Another statement of faith. God will provide. That will be a, an important phrase the deeper we get into this story. So they went, both of them, together. That's the story. And then, we, then as we get a little bit farther, when they came to the place of which God had told him, Abraham built the altar there. This man has built altar after altar after altar after altar, worshiping the Lord God, calling out in the name of the Lord God, explaining the Lord God to others who might come by and inviting them to worship the Lord God. And he probably never dreamed that one day he would build an altar and have to offer his own son to the Lord God. And he laid the wood in order. And I don't know how this worked, but it says, and he bound Isaac, his son, and laid him on the altar on top of the wood. Now you see that bound Isaac? Akedah is the, among our Jewish community, is what is the phrase that they use. It means bound. Akedah is this event that were the binding of Isaac and putting him on the altar. They still call that event the Akedah. Bound Isaac, his son, and laid him on the altar on top of the wood. It doesn't say that, that Isaac protested. We don't want to speculate because we just don't know. But it seems like he was a very willing sacrifice. Then Abraham reached out his hand and he took the knife to slaughter his son. Now I don't very, I very rarely quote Kierkegaard, but let me just read you a, a, a passage from his, uh, his book Fear and Trembling where he talks about this particular event in the life of Abraham, if I can... Focus my eyes on this fine print. Well, you know what? That's going to be impossible, but I'm just going to, I'm just going to have to forego the, 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 the full quote for him. Talking about Abraham um, was reserved a harder trial yet. And Isaac's, okay, I can't even read it. Go ahead and read it, brother, if you can read it. Where am I Read the fine print right there. Just that, that, fi fine, that print. fine print right there. All right, folks. There was many a father who, who lost his child, but then it was God. It was the unalterable, the unsearchable will of the Almighty. It was his hand uh, took the child. Not so with Abraham. For him was reserved a harder trial, and Isaac's fate was laid along with the knife in Abraham's hand. And there he stood, the old man, with his only hope. But he did not doubt. He did not look anxiously to the right or to the left. He did not challenge heaven with his prayers. He knew that it was God the Almighty who was trying him. But he knew that it was the hardest sacrifice that could be required of him. But he knew also that no sacrifice was too hard when God required it. And he drew the knife. Wow. Now you think about that. He took the knife to slaughter his son. He had the knife and his son's fate in his hand, is what Kierkegaard is pointing to. And many have had to watch their sons die because of some sickness or even with this COVID going on or, or an accident or something. But Abraham was called upon to slay his own son. Now you might say, why would God do that? Well, remember the very first line of chapter 22. And God tested Abraham. He was putting his faith to the test to reveal the quality of it. And I want you to remember this verse because this was never the intention of God to have human sacrifices. Sometimes you hear people quote the Abraham Isaac story as if you see what kind of a God is that. Hey, it was not his intention. He was put to a test. Jeremiah 19 verses 4 to 6. Jeremiah talks about those Israelites who had slipped over into the paganism of worshiping Baal, the Canaanite God. And it says here, And because they have filled this place with the blood of innocence, that is the blood of children, and have built the high places of Baal to burn their sons in the fire as burnt offerings to Baal. Yes, the Canaanites did that. And yes, that's why Joshua went in to exterminate them. That was God's judgment on the Canaanites. But it still persisted among others. 
But notice this. Burnt offerings to Baal, which I did not command or decree, God says, nor did it come into my mind. That was never in God's plan. He knew what he was going to do. He put Abraham to the test and Abraham was willing. Therefore, behold, the days are coming, declares the Lord, when this place shall no more be called Tophet. This is the south end of going out of the city of Jerusalem, a valley there, and when uh, and or the valley of the son of Hinnom, but the valley of slaughter. And I want you to see that that son of Hinnom is where we get in the New Testament Gehenna. Gehenna is the word for hell. Hades is the place of the dead between death and the resurrection. But Gehenna is the lake of fire, eternal hell. And so the Lord says, that's what I'm going to do to these people. This became a, a, a dump. This became a garbage dump south end of Jerusalem. And the Lord was showing his disgust for this awful practice. Never think that God was going to let Abraham go through with that. Never. Nor did it come into my mind, the Lord says. Go back to our text. But then at that moment, when Abraham reached for the knife, but the angel of the Lord called to him from heaven and said, Abraham, Abraham. And he said, here am I. And he said, do not lay your hand on the boy or do anything to him. For now I know that you fear God. Your worship, you have a worship that is trusting to the point you fear me. You show your fear through your trust of the promise that I've given you. Seeing you have not, now notice the word, you have not withheld your son, your only son, there we go again, from me. That word withheld is the word that Paul's going to pick up in Romans chapter 8. Because that withheld is the idea of you didn't spare your only son, the one and only, the unique one. Your unique son, your one and only son, you didn't spare him, you didn't withhold him. And I know you believed my word. And so, Abraham lifted up his eyes and looked, and behold, behind him was a ram caught in a thicket by his horns. And Abraham went and took the ram and offered it up as a burnt offering instead of his son. Boy, there's a picture of substitution, isn't it not? This is very similar. Instead of his son, the Romans 5, 8, where Paul says, but God shows his love for us in that while we were still sinners, Christ died for us. And look at Romans 8, verses 31 and 33. What then shall we say to these things? If God is for us, who can be against us? He who did not spare, that's the same word, translated in the Hebrew into Greek in the Old Testament, withheld right there in Genesis 22. That's the very verb that Paul uses right here in the New Testament. He who did not spare his own son, but gave him up for us all. How will he not also with him graciously give us all things? Who shall bring any charge against God's elect? It is God who justifies. We're children of God by faith, just like Abraham was a child of God by faith. And we exercise that faith in the Son of God, who the Lord God, the Father, didn't spare his own son, gave him up for us, and we trust him. The Lord wasn't going to have Isaac sacrificed. He knew what he was going to do through his offspring to come into this world to produce a salvation for you and for me did not spare his own son gave him up for us all and the lord justifies the the person whose heart is a heart to worship god and believes his word his promise and trusts in jesus who is the son who was willing to lay down his life for us and loving the Father who loves us so much, gave him up for us all. How will he not also graciously, and that's the point. God, by his grace, saves us. It isn't through our work, it's through the son that he didn't spare. 
It isn't through our good deeds. It's through his grace, through his son that he didn't spare. And as we come upon this week, Saturday night, this week, Saturday, it at sundown begins Passover. Sunday is going to be for us as Christians. We, be, we, we remember the, um, the triumphal entry. But as we get into this whole Passion Week, we want to remember the one who didn't spare his own son for us. Grace of God revealed that justifies us. Back to our text to finish it up. So Abraham called the name of that place, the Lord will provide. You remember he told Isaac, God will provide for himself a lamb. Now, there's a play on word. As is said to this day, they actually made a little proverb out of it. On the mount of the Lord, it shall be provided. Now, let me show you why some of your versions may say, say we'll see. Uh, the Lord will see. And uh, on the mount of the Lord, it shall be seen. Some translations have. You see, this is where we get in the old King James, Jehovah Jireh, the Lord will provide. And the idea of seeing and providing are very much related. When, when Abraham said to Isaac, God will provide, the Lord, God will see to it. God will see to it. And when he got up there, guess what? God saw to it. And he spared Isaac and he had the ram caught in his horns. And then when it says he, it shall be seen, actually that's kind of an awkward translation. It shall be provided. Yes, it's possible. Or on the mount of the Lord, you could say it's actually sort of like a, a reflexive verb. The, on the mount of the Lord, he shall appear. He shall appear. That's why if you go back to that Second Chronicles chapter 3, verse 1, on Mount Moriah where the Lord appeared to David, on the mount, he appeared. And God showed up. He saw to it, you see. And Jesus has seen to it for us. So the angel of the Lord called Abraham a second time from heaven and said, By myself I have sworn, declares the Lord. Well, who else is he going to swear by? By Buddha? Is he going to swear by Krishna, by Vishnu? No, he's, he's the only true God and says, by myself I have sworn, declares the Lord, because you have done this and have not withheld your son, your only son. I will surely bless you and I will surely multiply your offspring as the stars of heaven and as the sand that is on the seashore and your offspring shall possess the gates of his enemies. He confirms the promise that he had made and he says, and in your offspring shall all the nations of the earth be blessed. The one is Isaac, although he had begat other sons, Ishmael. But the one and only is Isaac, through whom the offspring is coming. And we know that's Jesus the Messiah, Jesus the Christ. And through that one, all the nations of the earth have the gospel preached to them and may be blessed. You, Abraham, have obeyed my voice. And that's why we consider him Father Abraham. So Abraham was tested. He passed the test. He was proven. He was tried and true. And then says Abraham returned to his young men. Didn't he tell them they were going to come back? That was his faith. And they arose and went together to Beersheba. And Abraham lived at Beersheba. So let's finish it up. That's why Hebrews 11 one more time tells us by faith Abraham when he was tested, offered up to Isaac. And he who had received the promises was in the act of offering up his only son. He considered that God was able even to raise him from the dead, from which, figuratively speaking, he did receive him back. It's a good lesson for us as we take this step and remember the Lord will provide. He'll see to it. Behold, John the Baptist says, the Lamb of God who takes away the sin of the world. There's the Lamb, you see. Romans 8, 32, He who did not spare his own son gave him up for us all. How will he not also graciously give us all things? And folks, if you've never trusted this Savior, this Lamb of God that the Lord provided, it's time to do that. Don't trust yourself. 
Don't trust your works. Don't trust your church. Trust the Savior, Jesus. And God will, in fact, graciously save you and justify you by faith. We will see you next week by the grace of God. Have a good week.